Okay, all right. Welcome back to our second meeting of the evening. Um, again, this is a hybrid meeting. Uh, so I'm going to call this meeting to order and I'm going to ask for tech to play Orlando Acknowledgement. Press. The land upon which we work, live, and sustain ourselves is the ancestral and treaty lands of the Michizagig and Nishinaabe, also known today as the Mississaugas of the Credit, the rightful caretakers and title holders of this land. We also recognize the rich pre-contact history and relationships, which include the Anishinaabe and the Ongwe Hongwe. Since European contact, this land continues to be home to indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. As responsible community members, we value the diversity, dignity, and worth of all people. Colonialism displaced and dispossessed indigenous peoples of their ancestral land. And continues to deny their basic human rights, dignities, and freedoms. We are committed to learning true history, to reconcile, make reparations, and fulfill our treaty obligations to the original peoples and our collective responsibilities to the land, water, animals, and each other for future generations. There's no additional item to the agenda, so I'm going to ask uh, Trustee Permanelli and Trustee Cameron to approve the agenda for me. All those in favor? Carries. Thank you. Any declaration of conflict of interest? I'm not seeing any. We're going to move down to item point five. And uh, as we move down to item point five one, okay, I'm just going to give you a little background and what we're here about this afternoon. So the board is proposing to re reenact a success successor education development charges by law and as previously this evening conducted a review of the education development charges policy the board will now hear from its edc consultant and lawyer and will then seek input from the public regarding the proposed new ch charges and bylaws and will give consideration to the submission received prior to passing the bylaw this is a formal public meeting as required by section 257-63 uh, of the Education Act. As previously mentioned, the board will consider passage of the succession education development charges by law on May 22nd, 2024. Now I will ask Associate Director Gill to introduce our speaker. Thank you, uh, Chair Green. This is the second public meeting required as part of the passage by the board of a successor EDC bylaw. Mr. Amandolia and Mr. Easto will present the board's education development charges, background study, and proposed new bylaw. Mr. Amandolia will now re review the EDC background study his forum has prepared for the board. Mr. Easto will then comment on the proposed new bylaw. Thank you again to the director, Mr. Chair, the trustees. Uh, so as we uh, just talked about, the first meeting we uh, conducted had to do with the existing policies of the existing bylaw. This second public meeting is forward focused and looking at the new proposed bylaw and what we're going to talk about tonight is some of the requirements that the board has to meet to consider passage of a new bylaw and as well I'm going to go through the methodology and significant assumptions or major assumptions that we made in the bylaw and ultimately conclude with the calculation of the new proposed rate. Um, so if we go move forward to the first couple of pages one more. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're just going to start by looking at what the existing bylaw is and a little bit of a history uh, of the uh, or the existing rate is and a little bit of history of those rates. So right now in the bottom of that middle box 2019 calculated rate, you see 3476 residential. So that's $3,000. $476 per residential unit. That's your EDC rate. And on the non-residential side, your rate is $0.46 cents per square foot of gross floor area. 
The reason that I have the 2014 EDC rate in that same box is just to uh, make everyone aware. Um, we talked a little bit about this in the last meeting, but that the charge is now subject to a phase in and a maximum if the proposed charge is greater than $300 of the existing charge on the on the residential side and 10 cents greater than the existing charge on the non-residential side. So as you can see, 2019 was the first year that your board's charges were subject to that uh, maximum phase in, but you can see that based on the previous charges, what would have been their existing charge back in before the 2019 bylaw, that it does not hit those uh, requirements because it was within $300 on the residential side and the increase was within 10 cents on the non-residential side. So this will be relevant at the end of the presentation, but just again, the existing charges 3476 residential and 46 cents per square foot non-residential. If we move to the next slide, I just quickly want to go over a couple of things that the school board has to do before you can be in a position to pass a bylaw. So we talked at the last meeting about why we're having that policy review meeting. It was a legislative requirement. You have to have one before you can pass a new bylaw. A couple of other things that the board has to do before they can do that. A background study. So that's largely where myself and my firm comes in, is the board has to prepare an EDC background study. And that's what contains all the assumptions and all the data and projections and forecasts that ultimately come up with a proposed charge. In addition to preparing that background study, there's a couple of things we have to do with that background study. The first one is we have to ensure that it's made available to the public at least two weeks before your first public meeting. So your first public meeting just occurred tonight. It had to be made available at least two weeks before that public meeting, and that was done. The other thing that we're doing right now is the board has to have two public meetings. So you just conducted your policy review meeting. At the end of this meeting, you'll have conducted your second public meeting. You'll have fulfilled that requirement. At the bottom, it says notice of those public meetings has to be provided and your legal counsel worked with your board staff to ensure notice of these public meetings was provided at least 20 days before tonight and provided in both newspapers and on the board's website. So all of those conditions, or at least after tonight's meeting, all of those conditions will have been met by the board. There's one outstanding obligation of the board. In addition to the background study being made available to the public, it also has to be made available to the Ministry of Education, and the minister must approve certain assumptions in that background study, again, before the board can pass a new bylaw. So that's the last thing that has to be done. That's in process. The ministry and ministry staff have your background study and are currently undergoing that review. Typically what happens is the Ministry of Education will provide a letter uh, to the chair and to the director of the board acknowledging, I hope, that those assumptions uh, and the background study has been approved by the minister. You'll then be in a position to consider new bylaw passage. So if we go to the next slide, the next part of my presentation is really going to focus on how we get an EDC rate and the calculation. I like to tell trustees that you know we we deal in in various um, aspects of of the Education Act and and legislation. Some very vague, um, but in this case, not so much. When we when we think about the Education Act and the Ontario regulations that govern the EDC, it's quite prescriptive. It's quite technical and almost goes through a step by step description on how we have to calculate these things. So there isn't much room for leeway here. It's it's really about following the direction of that that is provided for us in the various pieces of legislation. In a nutshell, when we think about the EDC calculation, there's a few things we're trying to do. Ultimately, this is a growth related need that we're trying to identify. So obviously we have to identify a growth forecast, a residential and non-residential growth forecast, and we have to determine how many students are going to come out of those units. That's what's determining the need. Then from there, really, we have to translate that need into how many schools are we going to require to accommodate that need? Then we have to translate how many schools into how much land, because ultimately that's what this exercise is, is acquiring school sites. And it's a rate. So the last part of the puzzle is really converting that land requirement 
into a dollar figure. So on the next couple of slides, I will try to explain how we go about doing that. So if we go to the next slide, one of the first things we have to do is determine need and also determine eligibility. So what we're looking at here, it's called Form A, and it's actually part of the EDC submission that goes to the Ministry of Education. And it's doing a couple of things. It's looking at your need, so it's looking at projected enrollment, but it's also the qualification trigger. And it's important to note that there's 72 school boards, not all of them have EDCs. I think it's somewhere in the 20-ish range that have EDCs. Why? Because you have to qualify to have an education development charge. And there's two ways to qualify. You can either qualify uh, through an enrollment to capacity trigger, which says if you have five years of projected enrollment, elementary or secondary panel, and that enrollment is greater than your on the ground bricks and mortar capacity, so not including temporary portables, porta packs, then you qualify for an EDC. If you don't qualify that way and you have an existing bylaw in place, the other way to qualify is if you have an outstanding EDC financial obligation, so you have not enough money in your EDC reserve fund to pay for outstanding commitments to land, then that automatically qualifies you as well. So right now for your board, you don't qualify on the enrollment to capacity trigger, but you do qualify on the reserve fund deficit outstanding needs trigger. Um, so you see in the chart on the, on the screen now, uh, it shows you the five-year projected enrollments under the uh, existing capacities. However, existing reserve fund is about $54.5 million. So that qualifies you for the EDC. So that's the first step. And if we move to the next slide, we'll deal with the next step. So now that we've determined qualification, like I said, we have to determine need. And this is a, a need resulting from new residential uh, uh, growth, new residential development. So obviously that need, we have to examine what the residential forecast is in your jurisdiction. So we work with the municipalities and with the region and compile a forecast. And this forecast is consistent with regional or municipal forecasts. So we don't try to reinvent the wheel. We don't try to move off of what our regional and municipal partners are telling us. We look for consistency. So that's what this forecast is based on. So as again, we talked about in the previous meeting, a couple of things to note um, in this forecast. Um, I, first of all, Mississauga and Brampton account for about 80% of the total forecasted units, Caledon about 20%. Although Caledon accounts for only 20% of the total forecast, it accounts for almost half of all the low density units remaining. Again, probably not a surprise. As Mississauga and Brampton build out, it's moving more to a medium and high density environment. Much of the low density land left in Peel region is in Caledon. Uh, as we talked about in the previous meeting, uh, many forecasts, if not all forecasts in the GTA are moving this way, where um, only about a quarter of the units are low density uh, proposed, about a quarter medium density, and about half of all the units proposed are high density units. Um, and the other important part, this forecast compared to what was used in 2019, about 53,000, and I, you heard that right, 53,000 additional units in this forecast compared to the old uh, forecast we used in 2019, that entire increase in this forecast, all medium and high density units. So the low density forecast is pretty much the same, a little bit less actually than it was in 2019, but this increase is all being driven by medium and high density development. So if we move to the next slide, our next part that we spoke about in the methodology is from that forecast, we have to figure out how many units is it gonna produce for the board? So we use yield data from Stats Canada, very small area, uh, density specific student yield data to figure out how many students, to project how many students are gonna come from those units. So this chart uh, outlines um, a couple of things. And again, these are all things that are submitted uh, to the ministry and included in the background study. So the first line you see there is new pupils for elementary and secondary panel. So of those units I just described, our projections estimate that the board will see about 
40,000 new elementary students and about 9,700 new secondary students. So now we've determined that need, but there's a step that we have to take before we can determine EDC eligible pupils. And that last step we have to do, the, again, the ministry, uh, was, sorry, the legislation tells us, compels us that we have to do this, is we have to account for any available space that the board has. So basically what it says is that you have, uh, you're expecting 40,000 new students. At the end of the 15 year forecast, there's an expectation, or again, based on projections, that the board would have, and that's that second line on the left, 15,375 available spaces in existing schools to accommodate some of that growth. The resultant need is 24,638. So the 40,000 less the 15,375, now you have your EDC eligible pupils. Exact same thing on the secondary side, your 9721 plus your 4751 available space, just under 5000 EDC eligible pupils. So the next part of the exercise becomes quite simple. Once we know that number, we work with your board staff and say, how do you typically accommodate students? What size of elementary school do you build in Mississauga, in Caledon, in Brampton? What size secondary school do you build? And then we've determined from this number and from those conversations, how many schools we're going to need. If we move to the next slide, again, the legislation makes this quite easy for us because this chart is right out of the legislation. And what this chart says is that based on those capacities of schools that we've just determined in the last step, this is how much land you get. So if you build a school between one and 400 pupils places, you get four acres. And for every 100 spaces you go up in capacity, you get an additional acre, all the way up to eight acres. Secondary schools, exactly the same thing, except it starts larger because secondary schools are typically larger. So one to a thousand, 12 acres, and then exactly the same. For every 100 in capacity, you get an additional acre. So at this point, we've determined our residential need. The residential need through looking at yields has told us how many new pupil places we're gonna to have to accommodate. We determine how much available space we have. We've figured out now how many schools and what size they're going to be. We now know how much land, or at least we estimate how much land we're going to need to build all those schools on. So there's a couple of last steps. So if we move to the next slide, the next thing that has to happen, I mentioned earlier, is we got to calculate a rate. And so we have to turn all of this need and land area into a dollar value. The way we do that, or the way the school board does that, is they hire a qualified land appraiser. And that appraiser goes through all of Peel region, looks at various transactions, uh, institutional school sales, land sales, house sales, and develops a per acre uh, land value for all the different areas and all the different sites that the board is going to need throughout the jurisdiction. So based on that number, uh, that analysis, the appraiser has developed a low in density or low and medium density value. So that's low and medium density houses of 1.9 to three and a half million dollars per acre. And again, that depends on where in the in Peel region that land is located. And then now, as as we talked about, we're moving into a more high density uh, unit uh, 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 landscape. Um, the and and as a result, the board is going to require school sites in some of these high density areas. The appraiser also provided the boards with a high density uh, approximation of site values as well. And you can see there's quite a variance um, between the low and medium density sites and the high density sites. Um, so high density sites, and these were all urban Mississauga sites, uh, valued between 10 million and $20 million an acre. And that seems to be, you know, in the general wheelhouse of a lot of urban high density sites that I've seen in the GTA over the last several months. Um, so if this was uh, 2018, presentation would have been a lot closer to over and it's we're almost there. But that would have been the last step is once we had the land values, we take those land values and we multiply them by the land that we need to get our net education land costs. 
there's an extra step uh, now because there was a change made again to the legislation several years ago. And what this extra step is, is uh, identified as alternative projects. And I, I think I mentioned in an earlier presentation I made to the Board of Trustees, we talked a little bit about these, these alternative projects. So um, just, just as a refresher and, and for those who maybe weren't at that last meeting, what the legislation now contemplates, so, so maybe taking a step back, the EDC monies that are collected typically are used to purchase the school site and to prepare or develop that school site. But that's typically where they would stop. They can't be used towards actual construction costs. That's a different uh, pool of money. However, what alternative projects contemplate is this, is that if a school board can buy or accommodate their school on less land than what is required based on that chart that I showed you earlier. So let's say that you have a school that you, uh, the legislation says you get seven acres and you say, I can do this on four acres. So I'm going to buy less land than the seven required, but I'm going to need to do some things to that school to fit that school on a four acre site. I'm going to need to do things like underground parking, I'm going to have to build a three or a four story school rather than a two story school. I'm going to have to put an elevator in that school. I'm going to have to put in things like turf fields and maybe play areas on the roof of that school to make all of this work. And that's going to incur additional construction costs that aren't funded through my traditional new pupil place grants. So what the legislation says is that if the cost to do all those things, not the cons total construction, cost of the school, but just those additional costs are less than what it would cost to purchase that additional land, then you can include those costs as EDC eligible alternative costs. So again, if the, the alternative cost is less than the delta of buying less land compared to what you could buy, then that's an alternative cost. So that's the other piece to this puzzle is we've attached land values. The majority of the sites are traditional, don't have alternative projects or cost to them, but we have identified six projects, like I said, all in urban parts of Mississauga that have been identified as alternative projects that all are located on smaller sites than what the board is eligible for, but all have had uh, uh, estimated alternative costs attached to them. Okay, so that was the last piece. So if we move to the next slide, we take all of that and basically we get what I kind of refer to as an EDC pot of money. These, this is your growth related net education land costs. It's all those acquisition costs, all those prep costs, all study costs, all those alternative costs, all added together. And that becomes one point, just a little over $1.3 billion in EDC costs. The rest of the calculation becomes fairly simple. Now what we have to do, and it, it reverts back or refers back to the policy review meeting, um, your existing residential, non-residential allocation, it's 90% residential and 10% non-residential. So we take that 1.3 billion, we allocate it 90%, 10%. And then we simply take that allocation and on the residential side, we divide it by the forecasted net number of new units to get a rate of, of 73.57 proposed EDC rate on the residential side. And same thing on the non-residential side, we take that 10%, so that 132.2 million, we divide it over the non-residential uh, projected forecast, and we get a propo proposed EDC, non-res EDC rate of a dollar thirty nine cents per square, a dollar thirty nine per square foot of gross floor area. So, next next slide. A couple more things to finish off. So, I also talked uh, about in the policy review meeting about differentiated rates, and we had a couple of questions uh, about that as well. So, when we submit these forms to the Ministry of Education, and when we prepare the background study, there are certain things we have to include in that background study. One of them, whether the board has a differentiated rate or not, and like I said, no board in Ontario does right now, is we still have to include what the proposed differentiated rates would look like. So this goes back to what I said earlier. So if we think back about what I just explained, the proposed uniform rate would be 7357. However, if you went to a differentiated rate, 
obviously you still have to collect the same amount of money. So what happens, best way to think about it is a uniform rate is the average rate. A differentiated rate then says, if you still have to collect the same amount, obviously low and medium are gonna pay more and high are gonna pay less. That's the, the point of a differentiated rate. So at 7357 uniform, differentiated, your low and medium would obviously increase, but your high would decrease to 3182. Okay, so the last part, and if you move to the next slide, is what your rate is going to look like in year one and over the term of the bylaw. So I mentioned at the beginning of this meeting is, is that if your proposed EDC rate is $300 or 5%, whichever is greater, more than what your existing rate is on the residential side, or 10 cents or 5%, whichever is greater, more than your existing rate on the non-residential side, then it's subject to a phase-in, and it's also subject to a maximum uh, increase per year of $300 or 10 cents on the non-res side. So what I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation was your existing rate when compared to your 2014 rate had only gone up within that permitted increase. So your rates were not subject to any phase in and your year one rate was the same as your year five rate. It was the rate throughout the term of your bylaw. As you've I'm sure noted by now, when I uh, uh, mentioned and presented the proposed rate, your EDC rate is more than doubling compared to your existing rate on the residential side and going up, um, I don't have it in front of me, but I think from 46 cents to uh, $1.39, so almost tripling on the non-residential side. So as a result, if we move to the next slide, your EDC now is going to be subject to that legislative cap and phase in. So again, your existing rate uh, residential side will go through first, 3476, but because of the maximum rate proposed at 7357, it's only going to go up by a max of $300 per year. And you see that in the chart. Year one, your new rate is going to be, if, if passed as proposed, 3776. And throughout the term of the bylaw, you're only going to go up $300 per year. Your year five rate is going to be 4976, still well under at year five what your proposed or maximum rate should be. Very similar on the non-res side, your existing rate at 46 cents, your new proposed rate or maximum rate at $1.39, so subject to that 10 cent maximum increase. So you're gonna go from 46 cents if uh, passed as proposed, 56 cents in year one, you're gonna hit a maximum of 96 cents in year five, but similarly still well under the $1.39 that you should be collecting right now. Okay, so a couple more slides to finish off. I just want to talk a little bit about next steps and the public process to date. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, in a couple of minutes, we'll have satisfied the legislative requirement of the board to conduct two legislative public meetings. Um, your passage consideration meeting is also going to be a public meeting. So, in reality, you're actually conducting three public meetings, so exceeding the legislative requirement. Um, as I mentioned, the background study has already been put out to the public at the Ministry of Education for review and approval as we speak. Um, in addition to the legislated public process, the boards, as well as myself and legal counsel and the appraisers, also conduct additional meetings with area stakeholders. So we have non-legislated, more informal stakeholder meetings where we go through similar things, the policies, um, the different assumptions with regard to the policies, the growth forecast, the, the projections. So we've conducted a couple of meetings with uh, stakeholders um, throughout the process. Um, we obviously tell them that, you know, just because we're having the public meeting tonight, they still have ability to provide feedback right up until the passage uh, consideration meeting. I will let trustees know that we, as I mentioned in the policy review meeting, there has been minimal feedback to date, um, but we have had an email from Madame, um, and we have had an email from the DG group. Um, we have uh, both those emails were 
um, really asking questions with regard to methodology and some of the assumptions contained in the background study, but nothing, in my opinion, anyways, of anything material so far or anything that has to do with any of the policy decisions that I mentioned uh, so far tonight as well. Um, so just if we move to the last slide, a couple of uh, uh, refreshers on next steps. So like I said, we await uh, background study approval from the Ministry of Education. Uh, staff will provide reports to the board to the board uh, prior to passage consideration meeting outlining many of the things that we spoke about tonight and the next time we're likely to see each other is May 22nd where again we have hopefully put the board of trustees in a position for consideration of a new bylaw thank you and back to you Mr. Chair thank you sir that's a lot of information especially for uh, some of our trustees who have never been through this before, but thank you. You were very thorough. Appreciate that. So I'm um, just uh, again, um, we don't see any public and with any questions uh, for us, but I'm going to turn to my colleagues to see if you have any question. I think that was very clear. Ex excuse me, Mr. Chair, if I, if I may, as, as your lawyer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I. I was I, I I was planning to I think it would I think subject to what you want to do it would be appropriate I was going to go through the bylaw that you'll be asked to pass in May just go through it quite quickly and point out to the trustees where where the changes were from the previous previous bylaw if if you would like but, but it, I think that that might be helpful for the trustees I I won't take too long I promise uh, that's fine Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the the bylaw is is the the form of bylaws in your package uh, as appendix A. It's 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 in the same form as it's generally been through the through the years. Um, there's not many changes to it. It imposes the charges that it, it, the rates that Jack has gone through with you on the residential side and the non-residential side. It it codifies some of the uh, exemptions for housing intensification, for example, and for de demolition credits, some of the mechanics of going through the, the bylaw collection process. Um, a big change, uh, there, there, is a, there is a big change I just wanted to draw to your attention. In, in November of 2019, the province mandated a number of exemptions to EDC bylaws, which hadn't been there before. Some had been granted, but some hadn't been, and and that that is um, private schools, long-term care homes, retirement homes. That's on page just it's on of the of the bylaw. You'll see it on page um, page five of the bylaw, uh, which I think is a different page number. It's it's page it's section section three sub three of the bylaw sets out these these exemptions for private school, long term care home, retirement home, hospices, child care center, memorial home. Uh, also, it just codifies the uh, the the, um, the exemption for colleges, community colleges and universities, which are there and an indigenous institute is also exempted. You'll also see this is where you'll see um, that the, uh, the sorry, excuse me, that that up on page on the page above page four, you'll see the exemption for the public hospital uh, in three sub two, and in three sub six, you'll see the exemption for for agriculture. But those are those are so those are um, the exemption for farm and uh, farming and hospitals are, are not mandated. But these other exemptions are mandated, and they must be in the bylaw. Um, so that's why they're there. But that's that's basically it. it just it's it it collects the bylaw. It's it's intended to collect the bylaw as calculated uh, by by the Watson Group in 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 their work. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, uh, Trustee Cameron, you had your hand up. I did thank you uh, through you, Chair. Um, so most of our new schools recently that we have built have 
uh, being for 650 pupil spaces. If I understand this right from the presentation, which, which by the way, I feel like I'm an actuary now after learning all of this, but thank you for the lessons. 650 pupil places would, would uh, in um, elementary would require seven acres in a, in a high density area site that would that would bring us there. Sorry, that would cost us 70 to 140 million dollars. Do is that right? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. So um, any place where um, those high density 10 to 20 million dollar values are uh, appraised are in urban areas and those are the alternative project sites where the board has I think the largest site that they're proposing there is four acres. Um, so those site those urban sites with a higher land value um, are smaller sites. That said, it's still, you know, 80 million dollars for a site potentially in one of those places if it's a four acre site at 20 million dollars an acre. So it's um, yeah, extremely high land values we're talking about in some of these high density areas. Thank you. That through you, Chair, that that uh, brings me to my next question. We had a discussion in our physical planning, finance and building uh, meeting recently where uh, we we're learning about uh, some developers would like us to build our schools on smaller sites. I can tell you that um, and it was a public meeting, so it's not a state secret, but we are not um, trustees in that committee are not um, in favor of seeing any of our schools built on um, much smaller sites than what the, what we have the right um, uh, to to buy the the issues are always it, it, it might even sound like seven acres is a lot of land until and all of us are in schools every day of our lives in, in this job, so we see it firsthand, but seven acres soon becomes a lot less than that. When you add the building and you take space for parking and you add a massive kiss and ride, and then over time as capacity of the school increases and you have to add portables. Um, and in some cases where we have possible drainage issues that were not perhaps identifiable at purchase stage, we have now a whole lot less space for our children to play in. So it, it's uh, it, it's an issue at this board uh, table where we have a collective voice where we would say, and no thank you to much smaller uh, sites. And um, I, I, I just I just think we, if we're developing a policy and um, um, creating something where a bylaw where we're supposed to focus on for the next four or five years we we need to have this discussion honestly about no no to smaller sites uh, at this board do you have uh any response to that sir uh thanks for that comment and question um and through you mr chair um i have a ton of thoughts on that um and probably you know not not something that we're going to get into like at, at this meeting, but yeah, I have a ton of thoughts on it and I can tell, you know, you and the, and the trustees as well um, that it's something that is being discussed um, at, you know, different levels of government with area stakeholders, with the development community, um, because it's 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 something that is coming up not only in your board, but in other urban boards as well, where we're looking at at similar high density land needs. Um, so I don't have an answer for you. I don't have an answer for this. I think it's complicated, um, but I agree that it's a it's a really important discussion, um, and I think it's a discussion that's starting to happen. Um, and and hopefully collectively, um, and I mean you know school boards, municipal partners, state area stakeholders like developers can you know come to some sort of solution or conclusion that that works for all. Um, but but yeah, I, I I totally understand it. And I totally understand your comment about, um, you know, school sites and the needs of school sites. It's a difficult conversation to talk about going smaller and more compact when the realities are that it seems like boards need more land area to accommodate all the different things they now have to accommodate on the sites. The other reality is that, um, 
seven acres of land in a high density area, it's not even the financial impact that is significant. It's that it doesn't exist. It's that parceling together that area of land um, just isn't there. So there has to be some acknowledgement that we have to try to find some creative ways in urban areas to look at smaller sites. And it's everything that the ministry is kind of espousing to school boards as well as more compact urban schools. Um, but I would agree with you uh, on the comment about, you know, some of the more greenfield larger sites when you talk about things like transportation, bus lanes, kiss and rides, additions, potential additions. Um, you know, it's a, it's a it's a difficult balancing act for sure. So I don't know if that's a great answer for you, but I agree it's it's a complicated discussion that needs to be had. Okay, uh, thank you for, for the answer. I, I think at the very least we're, we're on record now as uh, being a collective voice uh, against smaller uh, sizes for all the reasons we we have both identified. Uh, through you, Chair, can I have one more follow up question? Uh, quick, um, because you good? We, we have another in camera, so make okay, it quick. Um, the um, the the question I had was uh, when we have a school um, that's a large site and we're replacing that building, um, so we don't need more land. We're building it on the same site and then tearing down the older building after the new one's built. Obviously, is that is is that factored in here, or do we get money that gets to be used to take down the building? Is is that how it can be used? I can address Thank that you. if that's okay. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so any replacement, like what what the the scenario that you just provided, it wouldn't result in any additional land, right? So let's assume that under that scenario, land stays the same. You're demolishing a school, constructing a new school, and even though there may be new pupil place requirements that get accommodated in that school, the EDC again is related to the land or the site acquisition component. So there there wouldn't be funds that would be accessible um, in that replacement school scenario that you just provided. Excellent, thank you. Appreciate okay. your help. You're welcome. All right, uh, just before I go to the next uh, trustee, I'm just gonna remind us that we have an, uh, our closed session meeting that we have to get to and then come back to open. So please, if it's, it's a comment, I'm gonna ask you to save your comments, but if you have a question, I'm gonna allow you to ask your question. Okay, all right, trustee Clark. Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, my uh, just a co confirmation: uh, we're in the increases are at their max for both along both lanes, uh, residential and non-residential. Yes. 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 So there's no moving things around to take some. No. Okay. Okay. Well. Okay. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Thank you for your answer, Trustee Benjamin. Thank you, and through the chair, I just have a question. Now, EDC is generated by new housing units. That is what was presented. My only question is, what happens uh, in a development? You know, we had a school. We have a school, and then the school uh, is shut down, and then we sell off the property. Do we have a penalty for it? There's a board. So thank you for the question through you, Mr. Chair. So if it was uh, a school that was closed and that land is then sold, um, an existing school, then that is outside of the EDC environment. So that's where your disposition, your uh, different set of legislation governs how the board goes about disposing of that site and how those fun where those funds go and how those funds are used. So if it's an existing school um, that's closed and disposed of, it doesn't impact any of the EDC calculation. And I just see that Mr. Risto has a comment to add to that as well. Yeah, thanks. It, it, well, it, it, if if I may, through, through you, Mr. Chair, if if this if the land and building is sold was bought with EDC money in, in a school, if it was a land bought with EDC money that wasn't uh, uh, land bought with EDC money, just land bought with EDC money, you have to put back into the EDC fund what you took out of the EDC fund, to cease fund, but not not for a building. If, if that's a different that's a different story. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you, Thanks. Jim. Thanks, Thanks. Susan. OK, I'm seeing not a question. I'm going to ask Trustee Cameron, Trustee Davey, come on the floor for me. All right. All those in favor? Carries. Thank you. 
And we got no communication. And I'm going to ask Trustee Pamela Lee, Trustee Brad McDonald, adjournment. Thank you.